Hi, I'm Dr. Jerry Epstein, and I wanted to thank Lanier for inviting me to participate in this conference dedicated to the work of Dr. Robert Deswell. And it's a pleasure to be with you all here. Uh, unfortunately, I have not been able to attend. Uh, circumstances have not permitted me to come. But I do want to share with you some thoughts about uh, Deswell's work, uh, the work of my teacher, Madame Colette Abelkir Muscat, uh, and her relationship to, to Deswell, Robert Deswell, and uh, some of the uh, similarities and differences between their work and their aims uh, for it, which is uh, both seem to share values together, but there are differences in uh, intentions that you may have in the work that you do along these lines. So the uh, work of uh, Deswal, of course, as you're all familiar with, is a directed waking dream. And this is the work of uh, taking th set themes that Deswal had abstracted from his knowledge and understanding of the work of Sigmund Freud. He later on, uh, I'm not so sure later on if he adapted anything further to it. I do know the work of Hans Karl Leuner of Germany who also uh, followed in this direction of directed waking dream using the work of Carl Jung and established further themes for people to uh, follow uh, and explore. So the, uh, so the idea of set themes is very important in Deswell's work, and of course you're all familiar with this uh, approach, and it is a psychological system uh, based on a uh, psychoanalytic understanding of human consciousness and human motivation and, uh, and human exploration of self. And <clears throat> so it came to pass that uh, uh, I was put onto this work by my teacher of blessed memory with whom I apprenticed in Jerusalem for uh, nine years, going back and forth 13 times from New York City to uh, study with her for variable lengths of time. And I was initiated into this work in 1974, having come from the realm of uh, psychiatry and psychoanalysis, being trained fully in both fields, and then shifted my perspective when I learned this process of waking dream from her. <clears throat> her work was not called directed waking dream, and this is one of the differences, and she's been the inspiration of my work, uh, and that has led to my being a teacher and a, uh, um, uh, an educator and a writer in this field and the field, and I allied fields of mental imagery of various sorts and directions. And consequently, uh, this has uh, been the direction of my work for the last hmm, 39 years. And I've written a seminal book uh, in this field called Waking Dream Therapy, Unlocking the Secrets of Self Through Dreams and Imagination. And, uh, and many articles have uh, also appeared that are related to this subject. And <clears throat> I was put on actually to uh, Deswell's work through my teacher, Colette, who had an association with him for a time. And I wanted to share with you an anecdote uh, and then go into some of the differences and distinctions between their work and some of the similarities. The uh, uh, when my teacher uh, was getting her degree in psychology at the Sorbonne, uh, she was, uh, and she had been doing this work in uh, imagery and the exploration of self through imagery and the, and the imaginal experience. Uh, she, uh, since she was six years old, and, uh, but when she went to the Sorbonne to do her work uh, and to get a degree in uh, to give her a, uh, a background, a, a credential in this field, she d was doing it in psychology and she wanted to do her thesis on waking dream and imagination and imaginal work, but they told her she needed a supervisor. So the only person, the person who was available to be the supervisor at the Sorbonne was Robert Deswell. And they said she, that he had to be her supervisor, she had to have a supervisor, although she'd been doing this work for over 30 years uh, in, her, in her own developed way and so on, through the teachings of her father and her, uh, and, fam and her other family members 
who were familiar and conversant with this type of approach, uh, since it's come from an ancient tradition called the, the work of the prophets or the, uh, the chariot mysticism of Ezekiel and the visionary experiences of the prophets that were passed down through the teachings of schools in the Holy Land at that time called Sons of the Prophets. So it was passed down through millennia and generation to generation and she finally, and she was the, uh, the, uh, the repository of it really in the 20th century of this direct teaching. So they, uh, they said, no, uh, we understand your background and all of this, but you need to have a supervisor. So she called uh, Robert Deswal and asked him if he would supervise her. And he said, uh, without too much coaxing, he said he would be willing to supervise her. His schedule was very busy, very tight. He had very little time that he, think, he thought he could devote. But he said the only time then that he could meet her was at midnight. So she had to go to supervisory sessions with him each week for a period of months and months to meet him at midnight to, uh, 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 to uh, share with him her work in, uh, with the people that she was uh, uh, doing this process with. She actually had done uh, over 11,000 case studies uh, concerning a waking dream. And uh, so in the course of the supervision, they would meet at midnight, and there she would come to his kitchen, and they would sit and they would go through a supervisory session, and uh, there were three people in the room, she, Deswal, and Deswal's mother. And uh, so it turned out that Deswal had to be chaperoned at midnight by, her mother, by his mother, so that she was present to oversee the two of them being together at such a a uh, unusual hour, so to speak. And so they conducted the uh, uh, supervision with a supervisor of the supervisor, <laughs> of the supervisee. And so that's how she and Deswell had this direct contact for a period of time. And uh, so, and she put me on to Deswell's uh, papers, and I, I read her papers in English, of course, the directed waking dream experience and so on. And, uh, and as we all know, he, his work is, uh, uh, and the way you, is a psychologically based work based on analytic themes uh, coming out of the work of Sigmund Freud uh, and setting up uh, scenarios uh, step by step by step that each person would enter into and uh, become, uh, uh, and go through those experiences in a directed way with a guide who would take you through the process as you're all familiar with and do. So it had the, the focus of psychological understanding that the experiences of childhood create what you become as an adult, that uh, you had set the developmental themes of life going through the uh, stages of development, oral, anal, genital, oedipal, genital, and so on, and, and so that you, you kind of grew up through these stages by this, uh, this inner based exploration of consciousness. And the set themes then were to help liberate you to grow up as to become an adult and to live now as a mature adult in the world, having gone through all of these stages in a, in a way that wasn't done through talking, but through the natural and true language of the mind, which is image. An inner language, an inner base language, which is a shared social language of the world. So the themes of everybody's life was set forth through the analytic point of view, through these stages of development that you went through, that I just enumerated. The difference then, of course, that with Colette, uh, the work of Colette was more connected to a transcendent one or transpersonal direction, uh, so that the, uh, the focus of it was not through developmental stages, but on an axis of freedom. And uh, so what shaped my work in changing from psychoanalysis in the con way that I was doing it as a trained analyst to this work of Waking Dream was a c encounter I had with her in 1974 in which I had an illuminative experience in the first five minutes of our meeting. And during the course of that, uh, and I came into some state of consciousness that was quite altered from the ordinary state that I came into the, into the room with. 
she asked me in what direction does a train go as a consequence of the experience I was going through. And I finally answered her that a train goes in a horizontal direction. That was what I was used to primarily, and I thought that was the general way they go in the world. And, she, and then she said if we change the axis, and she lifted her arm in a vertical direction. And I had a illuminative experience of understanding that there was something of truth here that I didn't recognize ever, and I never thought about it in my conditioned life. And what came to pass was that it, I came to, uh, to see that this was a direction of truth that I had to follow, and she became my teacher, and I apprenticed for nine years uh, in Jerusalem, going back and forth 13 times for variable lengths of time before I, quote, graduated to become out of the apprentice uh, direction to become a, a teacher of this and a trainer. Consequent, and so the, uh, this axis of freedom became the key to the waking dream work that she was teaching me that we would take an element from a person's night dream that was spontaneously experienced and, uh, and use that as the way to explore and go deeply into the dream in waking life and continue the dream as an exploratory phenomenon in your waking life experience under the tutelage first of a guide until something happened, which I could tell you about in my own personal experience, in which the guide, the external guide was no longer needed. So I uh, took up this way with her and uh, it turned out that these, the, that the axis was the axis, the vertical axis that she showed me, which is the axis of freedom. Uh, taking us out of the conditioning of everyday life experience in what we would call the horizontal world and the habitual way of life and to uh, surmount it and, and uh, make a shift to go in this transcendent way. And uh, so the focus was taking an element from the dream, as I said, which had a vertical element in it. And I began to bring this work that I went through to my clinical work when I came back from Jerusalem to New York and started doing it with patients. And I paid attention to their dreams in a different way. It was no longer a developmental way of looking at their, uh, of how they experienced their life from childhood on. But I started to look at it through a vertical uh, lens, paying attention to that. And I found that many, many dreams had vertical axes in them. There were staircases in dreams, very commonly. There were mountains in dreams. There were hills in dreams. There were many, many elements that uh, took place that presented themselves in dreams that lent to going back into the dream and starting your waking life consciousness experience at that point where you find yourself back in that vertical direction. And and then, of course, what happened then, the, trend, the experience then was an up and down experience. The idea was to go down and explore and go down first and explore down into self. So the exploration was down into self. And then the exploration from there went up to the transformative and transcendent direction. And what I learned was the, uh, what was called, the if you will, uh, for our conversational purposes, the geography of inner space. And so the directions that, you, that we explored in inner space, going down is a descent into self. Going down to the left was a descent into the experiences of the past, the issues of the past. Going uh, to the upper left was the darkness of the past. Going to the left itself turned out to be the conflicts that you may have had with significant figures, mainly uh, either a par uh, usually a parent and often a mother. And then going straight up was a, uh, a transcendent experience to reach the heights uh, and move yourself and climb what was called the ladder of self-mastery to reach towards spirit. To the upper right was the movement that you would take to go into the, trans the, uh, the uh, transformative experience of recreating the past. Re creating the past in a new way. And going to the right was a transformative experience, a transformation that would occur in yourself from one stage of, of uh, being and existing to another. And going to the lower right was 
uh, coming uh, was the light that would uh, you would discover uh, as, in contrast to the darkness of the upper left. And so it was the light that pierced into the darkness that you would discover more about yourself and so on. I did not mention also the, the uh, geographical space of forward and back. So going forward is going directly forward in life, and back is what's behind you, which is there, which you don't turn around to look at. Uh, you know, in the themes of mythology of the West, the, there are themes uh, like, Oedip like Eurydice and, uh, um, and uh, Orpheus. And, you know, he's told when taking Eurydice out of Hades not to turn back. And in the biblical wisdom literature, Lot and his family are told, don't turn back. And there are repercussions and consequences about looking behind. It's over, finished, and done. And you could get trapped by that again in, in, with ramifications that could be harmful to you. So this was the, essentially the way that I uh, uh, was taught and what I brought to bear in this waking dream experience. Uh, and in my own personal waking dream, uh, I started with a night dream because then after my meeting with her, I had a night dream and the night dream had a staircase. And when I came back and told her about the staircase, she then had me then go down, just make a descent down the stairs and there, uh, going level to level to level, I finally discovered myself in a crypt. And uh, it was a dark space, and I was in this crypt, scary, and she was guiding me along the way to make sure I was protected and that I didn't, for instance, go into the crypt and the cop would close, the lid would close, and how would I get out, and so on. So she made sure that there was the, the, uh, it was manageable to go into this experience step by step by step. And then after exploring that area of the crypt and what it was like essentially to die, I came out of the crypt because this is imagination and anything can happen and there are no rules, certainly not of logic. And I would come out of the crypt and then ascend. So I came back from, I went into, if you will, a death and rebirth experience and that's very essential in the waking dream experience that I learned from her to go through a period of death, uh, leaving the habitual life, and then a, a rebirth, a come back into the life in a new way. And uh, so I ascended from the crypt and I walked up the stairs and I went up the staircase and eventually I found myself in a garden in, uh, that was in Tibet that was near a, uh, a Tibetan palace. And in the garden was my guide. And I found a guide there, uh, and he was a youngish man who was wearing a, uh, a head covering, like a, uh, a yarmulke, kippa. And he was Tibetan, but he was, uh, he was my guide, and, he had, and I asked him his name, he told me his name, and then he took me further to explore that dimension, that domain. Then I came back to the waking life and she brought me back to the waking life with the understanding that I could go back and then and explore further into this inner, into the inner consciousness, into the depths of consciousness, calling upon him to be my guide who would take me. And that of course we understood that this is a real experience, as real as waking life experience, and that this was a, a a, uh, a direction of self-discovery that was direct, piercing into self and into your relationship to the inner world and outer world without the use of words, only to describe the experience. So I described the experience to her as I went along. So she gauged where I was and what my feeling state was and what was happening to me so that if there was some danger, I could, she could give me something to help me protect myself. And following that, uh, um, that led to my deepening of this whole experience and setting my life uh, direction in this way. To shift from the field of psychology, psychiatry, psychoanalysis, to this way of uh, imaginal life. And the, um, uh, and of course I mentioned before this presence of the guide. And what happens is that in this work, when you go into the work, uh, I, doing this with others, 
I act as their guide. And, I, and they come and they tell me a night dream, and out of the night dream, I ask them to find the most significant element of it, usually and most often a vertical experience or door of some sort. They would open the door, and there was, on the other side of the door, a staircase or a pole or an elevator, something of a vertical way. And so then we did that exploration. During the course of that, and as we went on, it wasn't necessarily in the first meeting, which for me it was, but it's not necessarily the case. So then somebody going along this way would, after doing a couple of, a few of these experiences, would meet a guide. And the guide then would be asked the name, and, and, uh, and their function was to be the guide for this person who would take them on this inner journey. And once that happened, there was no longer a need for me. There was no longer a need for the external guide. The external guide was replaced by your inner guide. You could call that inner guide maybe an angel, perhaps if you wanted to designate it like that. It could be your highest source of wisdom that takes a form. For me, it was a real being. It's a real being that you discover in another dimensional reality, which is where the waking dream takes you to other dimensional realities. And, uh, and once that takes place, you go and you find him, and he's there always for you or she, or it, it could be an animal, and takes you, and then you make discoveries, and, and doesn't then prescribe what you'll discover. It becomes a spontaneous act of discovery. You're only led to the place in which a discovery is made. And that then gives you a wealth of information about your place in the world and about your relationship to your inner subjective spiritual self-consciousness and to your outer circumstances in the time-space world and how that becomes coordinated for you. And then you bring that inner experience to bear, just as in the Deswal experience, you would bring the inner discoveries, which is where they met, where Colette and Deswal would meet in terms of the work, that you would make these discoveries and then they would inform your everyday life, behavior, actions, relationships, and so on. So they would be your guide in life. So you use your own inner resources to make discoveries that would take you through life in a way that would be transformative for yourself and give you your, your clear direction and provide a sense of clarity for yourself in the world. In looking at the more definitively the, the matching uh, the work or uh, coordinating the work of De Swal and Colette, um, the, Colette's work was always sitting up straight in a chair because you had to be in a vertical, a vertical posture to uh, uh, mime the vertical dimensionality of these worlds that you were going into, worlds within worlds that you were making discoveries, which were ver worlds that you would ascend to and discover or descend to and discover. Uh, and I don't recall her telling me or in the work that I read about Deswell that people were lying down. I would not be surprised that that were the case because it was the analytic posture. So you might very well uh, have had people lying down and then going into these different states uh, of discovery. Uh, find a purse, find a sword, go into a cave and find a magician, go into a cave and find a witch, go and find Sleeping Beauty, and so on. So these were all definitive stages of development that you would explore and understand. The question, of course, is what did you do afterwards when you came out of the state of waking dream uh, in order to create a feedback loop where it would be uh, uh, kind of uh, a biofeedback or a mental biofeedback situation so it would get imprinted in your consciousness and become another, uh, as another habit of life that replaces the, the, the regimented ones and there's a newness of, of way of looking at the world, she would have me write and draw it uh, on, on a sheet of, on a notebook, in a notebook. And there would be a vertical line drawn down the center which would represent the corpus callosum, which is the uh, uh, shield between the left brain and the right brain. And, it, uh, and so we would, I would write the experience on the left-hand side of the page which would represent the left brain activity that mediates 
uh, language, discursive language and such. So I'd write, the inf I'd write what I discovered and then on the right hand side draw the uh, corresponding images to the content and that would represent the right brain which mediates uh, emotion and imagination. So they would, so I'd have, uh, and so the vertical line would be the corpus callosum between left and right brain. And there was to be a balance established between the two. And in the drawing of it, if there were any spontaneous feelings or thoughts that came up, they were to be written out alongside the drawing. Or if there was any part of the drawing that had to be focused on or, or made more explicit, draw a line and put a, t a, a word or two about what that was that you were drawing over there. At the end, you would sign it. So it was your creation. It was your work of art. And so it became an artistic endeavor. And at the top, when you were writing this out, you would put waking dream number and the date. So it fixes it in the time-space reality. You brought it back. And then uh, I would look at this every day for seven days and go over it, read it, go over the images and look at them, but not interpret or analyze what was done. It was never, it was only to be read as, if you will, hieroglyphs of the mind, uh, analogous to the Egyptian hieroglyphic experience that were carved on the walls. And so reading it and looking at the images was just to let it speak to you and to gain what you got without your imposing any of your preconceived ideas or thoughts or theoretical notions on it. And so that it, 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 when you received it, it said something to you, you allowed it, and you began to understand things out of that, which is what happened for me and all the subsequent people that I've worked with. Of course, I guess for all of you in the audience as well as for me, you could understand that this kind of process which circumvents logic and the question is, could this really shorten the time of therapy? Uh, could it uh, change the, 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 uh, the time and effort and expense that was involved in, therapy, in an ordinary conventional therapeutic situation? And uh, the answer to that is definitively yes, uh, because I, I didn't know what it was to be a psychoanalyst and I didn't know what it was to go through this. And in the book, Waking Dream Therapy, I think I have 35 uh, case histories, case illustrations of people whose life shifted markedly through one or two waking dream experiences and their life took a definitive turn to, uh, to uh, bring a unification of their life, to bring their life into harmony and wholeness. Each one of these patients that are described in the book had been in analysis 10 years, 12 years, 16 years, 18 years. They'd been in analysis for a very long time, and what I understood, that the analysis became a stepping stone. It was a, a level that you went through that actually prepared you to receive this work. So it was as though you were in the vestibule of the house and wiping your feet off on the carpet before you would enter into the living room and putting a coat in the closet and your umbrella in the stand and. Uh, and looking in the mirror and, and, and seeing how you look and all of that, and then open the door and find yourself in the, now in the living room. And here you were prepared to receive the knowledge that was already residing within you, that's already there, because it's understood in the spiritual tradition that we're born with all the knowledge in us. So it says in the ancient wisdom literature, we're made in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the image and likeness of God. So we're already endowed with all the knowledge inherently within us. What we needed is access to tap into that knowledge, to, un to unleash it, so to speak, to bring it into the forefront to be understood and recognized. So there's a, uh, a storehouse consciousness, uh, a vault, if you will. And, and in, a, in these other dimensional realities, there are vaults that can be open and in the vault is the treasure of these imaginal experiences, which then become specifically yours, because no two waking dreams could ever be alike. Uh, the theme is there, uh, the one of exploration deeply into self by going down, and the theme of transcendence by going up, but you get to know yourself very quickly. She said to me, I, she said to me, you know, 
he taught me something and I taught him something. <laughs> so we learned together, it was a mutual process. Because obviously she had to share the work that she understood with him and she felt that it helped to enhance his understanding and he in turn helped to enhance her understanding, uh, particularly about psychological uh, developmental theory and, and knowledge and so on. So they had a very nice relationship. And uh, this, is, uh, so this has been the fruits of my efforts, taking uh, my inspiration from her and being uh, then becoming a transmitter of this work, which um, has been very fruitful for myself and for those who've I've, whom I've taught. And so I'm glad that I've been able here to share this with you today uh, and give you a kind of a bead on this particular way of approach to the imaginal experience. I use the term imaginal because as you know, it that really has not found its way into the, certainly into the English language. It's not a commonly used term. And it was brought into the into the Western Europe language by Henry Corbin, who was a professor, uh, a French professor of Middle Eastern studies, who introduced the term imaginal into his writing. But he took the term from the uh, creative, imaginal, creative imagination work of Ibn Arabi, the great Sufi master of the, of the Middle Ages, who uh, coined this term as a level of existence, a reality that existed, another dimensional reality called the imaginal, where the, re the work of imagination takes place. And there are different levels of this imaginal realm. So this is, a, and the experience becomes an imaginal one, uh, and rather than a discursive talking one. Well, I uh, have been glad to take this time to share uh, these reminiscences, if you will, and my understanding of uh, waking dream experience and the connection of Madame Muscat with uh, Robert Deswal and the fruitfulness that has been born out of that relationship, both for all of you here and for myself as a recipient of her transmission of this uh, incredible work to me. And I wish you all very well in the conference. Perhaps someday we might meet. Thank you.